In 2020, he committed to divest the fund's holdings from the fossil fuel corporations, and he has taken numerous steps, not only to decarbonize the $250 billion plus of the fund's holdings, but to invest in climate solutions. He will share his experience and show us that we can and must require financial institutions to meet far higher standards when it comes to climate change than they have done in the past. If you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Thank you, Mr. Janapoli. The time is yours. Thank you, uh, Reverend Moab. Thank you, Abby, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I want to thank uh, Reverend Fletcher Harper for inviting me to participate in this very important discussion today. I uh, also want to acknowledge uh, my fellow keynoter, Dr. Atal Shah. It's good to be with all of you. I appreciate the context of the power of prayer to help us address this uh, crisis with regard to climate change and what we must need to do. Uh, I would also ask, since we have so many faith leaders on there, double your prayer for peace, given what's happening in Europe uh, as we speak on this very important topic with a lot of other things going on uh, in the world today. So I wanna commend Green Faith for your work to build a multi-faith global climate and environmental movement dedicated to creating a more equitable, sustainable world. Uh, as was mentioned, my faith tradition is Roman Catholicism. Uh, and as I know, you've been following uh, Pope Francis's encyclical on climate change, Laudato Si, the Pope wrote, I urgently appeal for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet. We need a conversation which includes everyone since the environmental challenge we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect us all. All of us can cooperate as instruments of God for the care of creation, each according to his or her own culture, experience, involvements, and talents. The urgency of this dialogue and the actions needed have only grown during this time of the, the devastating pandemic as COVID-19 has created even deeper economic insecurity in nations across the globe, further widening the gaps that we know have been growing for years, in part fueled by the environmental damage caused by climate change. Green face efforts to encourage religious leaders and their investment advisors to leverage the power of pension funds and other investments against this ever-growing threat to the future of our planet have never been more important. I'd like to share with you as trustee and fiduciary of the New York State Pension Fund, some of the engagement and investment strategies I've employed to address climate change. I come to this challenge with an abiding desire to do what's right and necessary for our planet and its people, but with the overarching responsibility to protect the retirement security of our pension system's 1.1 million members. I'm proud to tell you that today, the New York State Pension Fund is among the best run, best funded public pension systems in America, and also one of the most engaged and successful institutional investors in addressing climate change. Uh, it's about doing well by doing good, a phrase I'm sure you're all familiar with. As an investor and a fiduciary, addressing climate change has been one of my key priorities for years. The reason is simple. It's the right and the smart approach. Climate change poses enormous risks and opportunities for our society, our economy, and our investments. The impacts of inaction, of inaction are potentially catastrophic. As we know, the Paris Agreement, which thankfully the United States has rejoined, set the goal of limiting global warming to less than two degrees Celsius, which can only be achieved by governments and private sector entities, really everyone, realizing net zero greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050 at the latest. Put simply, net zero refers to the balance between the amount of greenhouse gas produced and the amount removed from the atmosphere. We reach net zero when the amount we add is no more than the amount taken away. A growing list of governments, companies, and investors around the world have set net zero targets and are adopting policies and plans to realize those 20 year 2050 goals. Because our fund is invested globally and across the economy, as the world moves to net zero emissions, so will our fund. And that's why we've set our own net zero goal by the year 2040, 10 years earlier, 
uh, that goal is a, an ambitious one, but one I think that is a very important one for us to embrace. Now, my view is that you can't simply divest your way to net zero. You must use your resources to advocate for policies that will drive this change and engage with the biggest emitters and move them towards net zero. And you must invest in the transition to the emerging low carbon economy. There are multiple strategies that we must use to realize our net zero goals. We formalized those strategies in our 2019 Climate Action Plan, where we spell out our fundamental climate investment beliefs and describe our comprehensive approach to addressing climate risk. Let me give you just a little bit of detail about each of those components of our Climate Action Plan. First, there's engagement. It's important to understand that as a pension fund, we are primarily universal long-term investors, and we have successfully employed passive index strategies for many years. Therefore, we have a strong preference for engagement with our portfolio companies and managers. We want our companies to succeed and our investments to provide strong returns for decades to come. When we identify significant risks to that successful strategy, we engage. That engagement takes many forms direct discussion with directors and executives, letter writing, proxy voting, filing shareholder proposals, even press strategies. We focused our climate engagements on the highest impact sectors and largest emitters, often collaborating with other investors through organizations and initiatives such as Climate Action 100, CDP, PRI, and Ceres. Our collaboration with the Church Commissioners for England's stewardship team was among our most impactful climate engagement initiatives and is an example of how a faith community worked in partnership with us for many years to move a major corporate player. We teamed up with the church commissioners in 2016 to file a shareholder proposal calling on Exxon to explain its plans uh, in its business plan in the wake of the Paris Agreement. How would they comport with the goals of Paris? something that the company had steadfastly refused to do. The first year we filed the shareholder resolution, we received 38% of the vote. The following year, we refiled the resolution and worked very closely with the church commissioners for England. And we built quite a coalition. And in fact, the resolution passed with an amazing 62%. In response, in the year 2018, Exxon finally produced the report that was requested. It was a step forward, not the only step they need to take, but a step forward. Over the years, we've seen many companies respond with significant actions that address our concerns, such as adopting greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, setting net zero goals, and committing to increase the use of renewable energy. Policy advocacy is another key. We are not going to address climate change, reduce investment risk, and protect our fund without governments around the world adopting robust policies that are necessary to drive the transition to a net zero economy. We do this by commenting on regulations, actively supporting or opposing relevant legislation and rulemaking, and meeting with and testifying before lawmakers and policymakers. Getting the right policies in place to support, incentivize, and drive the transition to a net zero world may well be the single most important piece of this complex puzzle. Another critical component of our strategy is investing, or more specifically, capitalizing climate solutions. A successful transition of the global economy to net zero will require massive investment of trillions and trillions of dollars annually in clean energy, new technologies, and resources. And it's not just about wind turbines, solar panels, electric vehicles, and battery storage that need investment dollars. It's also the technology and underlying components that are needed for power generation, electric distribution, hydrogen infrastructure, and low emissions manufacturing. As we work toward addressing climate risk and transitioning to the net zero economy, we must also ensure that we protect and support the workers and communities that are most impacted by the transition. Not only is it important for us to invest in this transition, we can also increase returns by seizing on the opportunities that it offers. Again, we can do well by doing good. This win-win approach motivates our fund's commitment to investing $20 billion across all asset classes through our Sustainable Investment and Climate Solutions Program, of which we've already invested over $15 billion. 
Our investment in climate solutions has taken many forms, including actively and passively managed public equity strategies, green bonds, and clean and green infrastructure, and real estate funds. As part of our program, we recently announced a new $2 billion commitment to a climate transition index that was developed by FTSE Russell in collaboration with the Church of England Pensions Board. This index combines responsible investment and active ownership with mission while ensuring the sustainable returns necessary to meet pension obligations. Again, it's a prime example of a church pension fund leading the way on climate investment. So finally, let's talk about divestment. We don't divest readily. It's never about sending a message or punishing companies. Divestment is utilized only when consistent with our fiduciary duty and where the specific risk posed by a company's failure to develop any meaningful climate transition plan is extreme and apparent. We take the time to develop a risk assessment framework for each specific industry, evaluate each company that meets our threshold criteria, engage directly with many of them and analyze their responses. Then for those that fail to meet our minimum standards, we conduct a financial analysis and obtain an outside fiduciary opinion to ensure that the investment will not harm the fund. Since the year 2019, we've evaluated 83 fossil fuel producers for their transition readiness and have divested from a total of 55 thermal coal mining, oil sands and shale oil and gas companies that fail to demonstrate viable transition strategies. Next, we'll assess integrated oil and gas companies, including the oil and gas superpowers such as Exxon, Chevron, Shell, and BP. It's a big task, but it all starts with the clearly articulated strategy of our climate action plan. And it's available on our website, as has the other points I've been discussing. So I encourage you to go there. And I hope some of what I've laid out for you today will be helpful as you put together your own investment and engagement strategies. The stakes are enormous and the work is complex. There are no simple answers, but we can do it. The more investors speak with one voice, the more effective we will be. Working together, the power of our funds can move companies, nations, and the world towards a more equitable, more sustainable, more economically secure future. I'll leave you with more words from Pope Francis. Future generations will never forgive us if we miss the opportunity to protect our common home. For my part as New York's controller, I will continue to seize that opportunity by taking the right actions for our planet and employing the best long-term investment strategies for our pensioners, present and future. Each of you and the many other organizations that Green Faith represents have a critical role to play in this endeavor. And I look forward to collaborating with Green Faith as we move forward. Uh, thanks to all of you for participating and, and good luck to us all. Comptroller DiNapoli, you, because we're online, you, you can't hear or see the virtual standing ovation that you're receiving, but we're so, we're so grateful. And I've received several questions during your remarks. I wonder, might I, might I pose a sort of synthesis of, I think, the most important question that's come through? Absolutely. So we, we have people from Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, Sikh, Jain, uh, Jewish, Christian communities on the call, and uh, all understand that the work you do involves quite a lot of pressure in terms of balancing multiple demands and responsibilities. Uh, and you've, in the midst of that, provided such compelling leadership. How has your faith what role has your, your own personal faith played in that? What kind of inspiration or guidance or support or <laughs> help in lat times of last resort has, has your faith offered you? I think everybody would enjoy hearing that. I, I appreciate the question. It's actually not something I talk about publicly a lot. So you're giving me a, a unique opportunity here. Uh, but but um my faith is very important to me. I do attend religious services regularly, and I've been in public life for uh, many years, 20 years in the state legislature before my 15 years as controller. So I've, as was mentioned in the intro, I've had the opportunity to be exposed to many uh, faith traditions and, and, and celebrations. And I, I just think faith and a belief in something greater uh, ha has really 
grounded me in terms of a sense of, of hope and optimism, a belief that there is a, a greater plan out there. I will say that, uh, you know, uh, as a Roman Catholic, uh, if I could um, share my, my very personal view, I'm really thrilled that Pope Francis is our Pope right now because he speaks to the kind of issues that have kept me as part of the Catholic community, despite the challenge of that. I'll, I'll just leave it at that separate discussion offline for us to have. But the fact that early on in his pontificate, he identified climate and the environment uh, as one of his key priorities to, to move the church and, and to be engaged in the world community in that discussion uh, has really been a great inspiration. I mentioned Ceres as an organization that I'm sure you've collaborated with. I'm on the board for Ceres. And, and, and one of our uh, board members, my colleague and my counterpart in California, Betty Yee, actually went to the Vatican to meet with Pope Francis as part of this discussion. So, so I've, I've really been heartened that my, you know, my public role is very much strengthened by the leader of my faith really speaking to the urgency of us addressing this issue. And, and it's important because, you know, as you point out, there, there are a lot of pressures that, you know, we're under. And, and the bottom line for me, I have an awful lot of folks that depend on us making the right choices so that their pensions are secure. And, and you know, I, I, what I hope I conveyed, and I'll, I'll sum up on this, is um, none of this is, is easy. Um, and, and I think part of what we're trying to explain is that we've got to move to a better place. And, and divestment is part of the strategy, and, 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 I, and I appreciate your emphasis on it, but, but you know, divestment of fossil fuels is, is, is a piece of it. We've really got to look at every sector of our economy, you know, transportation, agriculture, uh, utilities. Uh, there's, we got to move every part of, of the economy in the right direction. And, and we want even some of the folks who may be the bad players now to buy in the, into the transition. The reality is some of these fossil fuel companies have the resources and the expertise to go into the renewable space to, to, to get us to a better place. So, so that's why our emphasis is, is on the commitment to making the transition. And, and so I just leave you with that because it, it, it's going to be a multi-pronged, multi-year effort, but we don't have that many years to go. And that's why we've, we've set that more ambitious goal for our portfolio of 2040 ahead of the usual 2050. But yes, my faith, um, which has been strengthened in recent years with, uh, with the Pope that we have today, has, has certainly been a very important source of strength and inspiration to me. Well, thank you so much. And I, I know that there are people from beyond the Christian community who also are awfully happy that Pope Francis is the Pope. Uh, he's, he says a lot that matters to, to all of us. And, and thank you so much. We know how busy you are and we're we're so grateful for your for your time and for your sharing your your wisdom with us. And I'll I'll pass back to Reverend Mohawk. Thank you. Thank you. So as you've um, already highlighted, it's vital that we ground our efforts in our faith, in the, in those teachings, their worldviews and values, and because these are more important now than ever. 